Brilliant. Um, here we are. We've recorded some silence and we're all in the same room, which is fantastic, at uh, Og Camp live. Um, thanks everyone for coming to uh, the recording of Linux Voice podcast series three, episode 19. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm Andrew Gregory. I'm Ben Everard. I'm not Mike Saunders. I'm Andrew Conway. And I'm Graham Morrison. And in this fun packed po- um, podcast, you've, as you've already heard, um, we'll be having news, no neurons, because Mike is in Amsterdam obliterating his neurons. <laughs> <laughs> A, a, a live spontaneous voice of the masses and that other thing we do, which is finds of the fortnight slash week slash discoveries. Oh, we should introduce Andrew, shouldn't we? We should, yes. Um, Thane of Glams and Corda <laughs> <laughs> uh, and astronomy. Uh, yeah, well, thank you very much. Uh, it's good to have a token northerner on the, on the podcast because uh, your previous one went south a bit, didn't he? So, yeah, I'll do my best, although I'm not Cumbrian. <laughs> Well, he's German now. He's German. I mean, okay. he, he talks about all of us as us lot, so he's, he's fully yeah. integrated. Yeah, um, you, you may know uh, Andrew from his, some of his work with uh, Linux Voice. Um, he's contributed a, an excellent tutorial on um, economic modelling software for the forthcoming issue, which goes on sale um, in November. Yeah. Sometime. We should... We'll edit that back in. <laughs> we still haven't nailed the sales technique yet. But um, Andrew's stuff is really good because I did economics at A-level and uh, I found it really difficult. Had you been my economics teacher, it would have been a whole different... I could have had a whole new career. Yeah, well, my main advantage is that I'm an astronomer. Not in, not in, I don't know much about economics from university, so there you go. Maybe that's why it's good. Could be, yeah. Right, is it time for news? It's, it's news time. News, right, this fortnight... First up, uh, net neutrality. The EU has voted in favour of net neutrality. And I have some quotes now from the the resolution thing they did. There will be no blocking, throttling or throttling of online content and all traffic will be created equally. So it sounds like good news. Except all traffic isn't created equally, or at least some is more equal than others. Uh, They're allowed traffic management in what they term broad categories. So they can't sort of say, okay, well, the BBC can have full crack, but Guardian, that's a bit slow. But they can say, web traffic, we're going to slow that down for a bit because it's a congested period, or more likely, these guys torrenting stuff can have like one byte an hour. So um, so that Netflix works well. Uh, you allowed specialist services, and you're allowed to prioritise these, and they think things like self-driving cars. Um, I don't know why self-driving cars want to... Uh, when you say you're allowed to, to prioritise these, do you mean ISPs? ISPs or? are. Right. And they're also allowed to zero rate stuff, which is like, it's stuff like the Facebook they're trying to do with internet.org. So you can have the internet for free, but it's not really the internet. You can have these sites for free, but you have to pay for everything else. Uh, which, basically, uh, it's ambiguous enough that they can do almost anything. Basically, they've said there's no throttling of online content and all traffic will be created equal and then given a loophole the size of a bus. <laughs> so the... <laughs> There is blocking and throttling of online content and all traffic isn't created equally. And it's just in Europe, really, because they don't control China or the United States. It's not even Europe, because uh, David Cameron apparently made him cough into his cornflakes because he's not allowed to block uh, adult images anymore. Uh, oh, so right. does, he, does he do that quite a lot, do you think? <laughs> <laughs> the last month or so, yeah, yeah, of a certain kind. Yeah, it's been a bit stressful. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> You can get Farmer's Journal in print, though, still. <laughs> so he's, he's fine. So, yeah, in order for us to protect the children, where we don't have net neutrality, because net neutrality is bad. Okay. So children good. You, yeah. and you and I, Ben, have kind of disagreed on net neutrality a little in the past. You don't think it's such an important deal. I don't think it has existed. I don't think it can exist. I think it's fundamentally flawed as a concept on a technical level. But doesn't this give companies a mandate to basically create a two-tiered internet? There, there um, will always and, be and a two-tiered internet. And also the language internet. they use is very Orwellian in, in terms of it will aid innovation. Where, in fact, Tim Berners-Lee himself said that innovation in the internet came from the neutrality part. My point of view on this, for anyone who doesn't know, is that the net, the internet isn't a thing that's there that you connect to and you get data from. It's a mass of jumbled wires going all around the world in no particular planned order. 
Uh, so, for example, Netflix, what they do is they go around all the ISPs and go, here's a big box full of all our content. You can, so it's right next to um, the place you download it from. If I was to download, I was, I was to set up a rival to Netflix, I have my server in, I don't know, in Bristol. Some, anyone in uh, New York who wanted to stream would get much lower rates because obviously it has to go through satellites and under oceans and things. And I can't just turn around to an American ISP and say, here's my box, I want you to stream music, uh, movies off it. They can say, well, no, nah, we do it for Netflix, we don't do it for you. And that's not, you know, that's obviously not neutral, but there's no way to stop it. What do you say? You have to, every ISP has to take every bit of data with, I want to put in their warehouse. Well, I think I think you're right. It's hard to stop it. Basically, you're saying if you've got enough money, then you can afford to pay the ISPs or other organisations to to give you preferential treatment, yeah. which I think will happen. But that's also why we have laws uh, and regulations is to curtail that and stop it. It's not one big company that's got huge, you know, a GDP of more than some countries. Thinking of Apple, for instance, uh, or Netflix if it grows and gets lots of investor funding. Um, in that case, you do need some kind of regulator to step in and try and stop it. Trouble is, the internet is global, and there is not even global law, let alone global internet regulation. Um, there was a piece on the register, actually. There was a guy talking about this sort of thing, and he said, you're looking at completely the wrong side of things if you're looking for everything to be treated equal. What you should look for is a lowest limit. So when you go to your IS... When you, if I wanted to set up my video stream thing, I could say, I got a contract with the ISPs, and they say... They will stream that every bit of data will have come across at, at least this speed. You know, some things may be faster because of the way the networks work and all that, but the, the lowest level that they will provide is this. So they can't throttle anything below that. But so when you're paying for it, you know what you're paying. I'm getting that. And that's a, and someone else could say, ah, oh, we'll give you this speed, this lowest speed. Everything will come above that. So it's a sort of lower limit that yeah. everyone can guarantee you, you won't fall below that. Yeah. So, right, okay. But. I know this is, I'm quite controversial. Everyone else seems to agree with net neutrality. But. Well, I, 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 it's just, I'm, I suppose we've been talking about it a bit too much, but I, it's, I don't think that um, the law should protect net neutrality. I mean, it worked already in the case of Netflix. Netflix has already made its own infrastructure and arrangements with ISP. That was happening anyway. Yeah. Um, and and to, to set a kind of official mandate for this being acceptable kind of opens the floodgates for, you know, well, for all kinds of things. I mean, my imagination probably has... Well, th yes, it ends up having, like, people... We The end of, basically, a free internet. I think that's that will be the end game. It's just like the first step, and then a bit like um, privacy and encryption. And really, the, the purpose of policy is to, to create an ideal whilst remaining open enough for people to innovate around it. Shall we... Uh move on to the next item of news before we end up being the net neutrality podcast. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's not much Linux news this uh There's not much Linux news. Um, in fact, it's more political news now. This is breaking news from today, I think. Excellent. Um, which means I only read it on my phone, so. <laughs> um, so yeah, from wildly wrong, shout out, if anyone knows better. But Theresa May has been on the news uh, talking about the Snoopers Charter. She said, oh, uh, it turns out this encryption thing Actually, a little bit important. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, she's a smart cookie, isn't she? she? <laughs> and it, it only took her a year to work this out. I don't think she's worked it out. <laughs> this is the these are not the droids you're looking for moment. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just yeah. They're not going to ban encryption, and they're not going to allow the security agencies to just scan your browser history willy nilly. No, but in that very same statement, she said. We're here to protect you and your family. Oh, the family. <laughs> your, your hard-working family. Yes, yeah, sorry, <laughs> hard-working family. <laughs> um, yeah, what they said they will be able to do is tell who you've spoken to and when you spoke to them, not the content of it. It's a classic going back no, to the metadata, metadata that's data. been going on forever. And there was lots of woolly languages around, language around it. And we don't yet know exactly the content of it, but just reading through the lines, this, is, this isn't really news, this is my opinion of the news, uh, which is the same for all of it. But um, I think they're going to ban end-to-end -end encryption. I think that's what's coming. I think they're going to say you can have encryption, but it has to be tapped in the middle. And if we come to you, you know, the communications provider, you have to hand it over. And they think it'll make, they'll make it illegal or a criminal offence. I think they'll make it a legal requirement for anyone handling your data 
to have access to this it. This is a little bit like, was it like the late 90s when the US had like an export ban on PGP? Yeah. Um, and so that was unmaintainable and impossible to police. Yeah. Because so, <laughs> that they got around, didn't they, by printing it in a book and sending yeah. a book over. So they sent yeah. <laughs> the source code in a book and sent it. So you're saying we should have IP over printed paper. <laughs> <laughs> it may come to that. Yeah. Print is good. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Be like that, uh, the, like the Times with the spies sending weird messages in the adverts. <laughs> yeah. You're just opening up Linux voice. We should. Yes, yeah. anyway, just we should. The, yeah. the CIA and just for a laugh. Yeah. yeah, the eagle flies at midnight. <laughs> <laughs> so, one thing that I read about that is that the reason that she, uh, Theresa May, the Home Secretary, might have rolled back a bit is because she's nervous that our unelected upper chamber, the House of Lords might again embarrass the government over this bill. <laughs> yeah. This is this is son of Snooper Snoop uh, Charter, isn't it, that's about to go through yeah, this week. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and they're worried that this might happen again. And it's, it's almost ironic that the upper chamber uh, is unelected, that most well, a lot of people are questioning whether that's right in this day and age, is actually doing a better job in some ways of <laughs> representing the public. You're saying the undemocratic chamber is more democratic than the democratic chamber. Yeah, and there's a <laughs> kind of crazy twist of fate. It seems that way at the moment. Despite Andrew Lloyd Webber flying all the way back from New York to cast his vote. Well, he was working in a musical, he said so, it must be true. <laughs> <laughs> against, against um, tax cuts. Yeah. Um, but we don't do politics, do we? Yeah, let's move away we from move politics away. Um, to something that's almost Linux. We're getting close now. This is uh, GNU Herd has just released 0.7 release. Wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I read the release notes for this and I didn't understand them. <laughs> <laughs> but they How long were the release notes? They weren't that long, but they said file system quite a lot. Um, and then things about file systems that I don't know. So I think this has got something to do with file systems anyway. Um, but yeah, I thought we'd just have a quick show of hands here. How many people have used GNU Herd? Define you. <laughs> <laughs> How many people here have booted GNU Herd? <laughs> so for the listeners, that's probably, I don't know, about 5%. How many have used it on a VM versus hardware? Okay, who's used it on real hardware? Rich <laughs> haven't you used the herd, Andrew? I just yeah. remember you saying that. Yeah, I, I booted into the herd, I think in a VM, um, and ran LS, changed directory. <laughs> Took the screenshot, yeah, closed it down. That's right, forgot about it forever. Put it on your CV. Yeah. <laughs> so, hands up if you've used the herd more than Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> That's one person. Two. Elite. <laughs> but I think a slightly more interesting question is who would want to use the herd if it if there was this sort of almost Linux kernel like rough level of compatibility? Do you want that? Would people would you switch from Linux to GNU herd? You mean driver compatibility? Just generally working. You can have a live <laughs> distro that you can put in your machine and use. Does that Yeah. So uh, just a quick show of hands if you would like to be able to use GNU herd as your day to day system. So maybe seven, eight people. There needs uh, to be a marketing campaign explaining why it makes a difference. Yeah. Which yeah. obviously the FSF does awesomely. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> but that, that, that marketing campaign would have to begin with what does GNU stand for? <laughs> <laughs> and the four freedoms. Yeah. yeah. The three, four freedoms. No. Isn't... Herd and Mac, aren't they mutually uh, recursive? And, uh, a herd of interfaces representing depth. That's it, and it's yeah. herd spelt the other way. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so the list of why it's called that is twice infinite. <laughs> um, so uh, how much, do you know how big a change in terms of code commitment that is in Something about file systems. Right. I just wondered how many, how many people are actively working on it and contributing to it. I honestly don't know. Uh, do we have any herd developers in? No. No. So the one person isn't here. No. Um, if you're interested in learning more about writing file systems, Ben has an excellent tutorial in uh, the, the forthcoming issue of Linux Voice, which is on sale at, at some point. <laughs> but I still don't understand them. Um, 
Yeah, sticking with software, uh, the Tor, the, the Onion Router, the anonymizing, encrypting network thing to stop Theresa May doing what she's just about to announce she's going to do, um, has launched her own messenger client. Um, so basically, the way this is just in beta, and this was released, this is again breaking news, I believe. Um, and it's not a complete messaging infrastructure. What they're doing is it's uh, so it runs on top of existing messaging systems. So your Facebook Messenger, your Google chat, hangouts, whatever it is at the moment. Uh, this sits on top of those and gives you the OTI, off the record, uh, which is a sort of standard encryption set and makes it all really easy to work. And the idea is for non-technical people, you have an app that you can install or run on your live distro and you open it and then you have encrypted me anonymous messaging. Right, so it doesn't use Tor. I was reading this as we came yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I always <laughs> ask you these questions. I, I believe, and I'm not 100% clear on this, it sort of allows you to access, it, you can use it without Tor, I think, but it allows you to access it through Tor as well. Right. Um, but I could be wrong on that. Okay. Um, so uh, that's... Is it end-to-end -end encryption? Uh, OTI is end-to-end -end encryption, yeah. So it's going to soon be illegal to use that? Probably. <laughs> yeah, the... Uh, Men in dark glasses will come knocking on your door and uh, burn your laptop to the ground should you install it because uh, because terrorists. You could and defeat children. and children. Yes, you could defeat end-to-end -end encryption by saying, "No, no, actually, I was sending this 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 uh, thousand-character stream of gobbledygook to my friend and say that that was an encrypted message." Yeah. Well, it's uh, it was like a thing back in the day where you put like random words in your email to try and blow their scanning systems. All I've always wanted to do is start carrying a USB stick with just random data dd to it. <laughs> yeah. So if I ever get stopped at an airport. And my, my, my sole point of view on this is they'll take it and they'll try and crack it. And that just drains their computing power as they try and crack this. Uh... They'll ask you for the password and when you don't give it to them, they'll put you in prison. <laughs> <laughs> Which has happened. Yep, yes. yep it has. But, but we, we could... did, I mean, we did do a really good tutorial. I, I really loved it, it was by Jake. Um, Morganson, yeah. and he did the hidden encrypted partitions. So yeah. the hidden partition table inside a hidden partition that was all encrypted. But if I publish an article in the magazine saying this is how you DD random data to a disk, and yeah. then if I ever get pulled over, I can say, look, I wrote an article all about <laughs> <laughs> DDing random data to a disk. It's, yeah, it's published. You're still you're still helping the terrorists. Yeah. Oh. So yeah. Oh, and, and the children coming, and out, coming over here. You're trying. not helping the children, you're doing bad things to the children. What if they have to prove that it was encrypted? Exactly. Oh, how how could they? Exactly. 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 Which, which is like a second, <laughs> and that's like a second reason I would do it. Because if I could say, if I could show, surely isn't it beyond reasonable doubt? Or am I just, is that just what they say on telly? No, I don't think it is. If I could... If I could show beyond reasonable doubt, maybe, that that was just random data, then anyone who needed to get encryption through could go, wow, that guy, that ginger idiot, yeah. he carries around a USB stick full of random data, so do I. So a random, uh, uh, an encrypted uh, partition of random data. <laughs> just have it all the way down, like thousands and thousands of <laughs> yeah, nested yeah. encryption. Or oh, yeah. the password to that one. Yeah. Big old file that's f from slash dev slash u random. Yeah. And then encrypt that. And then encrypt that, yeah. and then that. Yeah. And then we all need to have the data on our own USB sticks, like the old keywords and emails, you know, we'd have bomb and terrorist and paedophile and signatures. <laughs> Just enough of them to tie up all their computing power as they're trying to decrypt them. <laughs> what, if, what if by chance the random data you had? <laughs> generated something like child porn. <laughs> And then I think we just all have to give up and go home. Yeah. Well, you can extract any signal you want from white noise, so it's inevitable you'll find an expert somewhere who can do that. I'm going to have to throw away that USB stick now. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, one final, one final item of news before we, uh, we move on. Apple has rejected the CCTV. That's a Chaos Computing Congress, the sort of German security hacking collective. They, uh, they created an app for Apple TV to show their talks on computer security. Apple have said computer security is such an offensive topic to them, they ban it outright on Apple TV. 
Uh, I think silence so net is net neutrality then? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Were they to show it, they would stream it perfectly. <laughs> Um, that is, to me, that's a really chilling thing. This isn't illegal. This isn't. It's not even offensive, is it? Is anyone here offended by computer security? Current well, state, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. That so, sa sounds like the, the golden rule of politics, which is if it if you can't fix it, it isn't broken. You know, ignore it; it will go away. So I, I can see how it's in Apple's interest to deny that the concept of of computer security exists. Computers just ask, Apple products are secure. Yeah, so they deny it exists and also claim we're very good at it. <laughs> Which is just what talk, talk do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of talk, yeah. Yeah. Um, so this, to me, this is actually a really chilling thing that this company have said, nah, we're not going to, you know, we, we control this content, we control this walled garden of, of video and it shall not have computer security on it. It is really chilling and I'm finding it difficult to engage with it because it's Apple and I feel like Apple users who buy into it deserve what they get. <laughs> See, I, I, I say that with an Apple. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and that's why it took so long to set up. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, oh, I don't know. It's one of the huge companies obviously do a lot of good things and a lot of bad things and a lot of stuff that are neither good nor bad. And I was almost starting to like Apple the way they've stood up and said... Yeah, they have done a really good job with that, sorry. Yeah, they've stood up for their users and said... And the US government uh, taken these devices from people they've arrested and said, Apple, decrypt these and tell us what's on there. And Apple have said, we can't. We've set up... Uh, we've to said, us, they've said, we can't. Yeah, I phoned up uh, <laughs> Steve Cook and I said, can you do it, mate? And he went, nah. But to the government, they said, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're standing up for users on yeah, encryption and securing data and uh, then just chucking, saying security is such a dirty word, it's banned. It's almost like the classic obfuscation point and Bruce Schneier saying that, you know, it's better, of course, security is better when it's open and we all know about it, but big, big companies and corporate policy doesn't seem to get that. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's connected with piracy and privacy and encryption. You know, that, that's kind of the same point. So I'm sure we'll move on to them in a bit. Well, yeah. for me. Um, but uh, I think that's enough news for this fortnight. Um, Excellent. What's well, we got next? Let's play. Finds. 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 Um, so I normally ask the IRC channel if um, <laughs> they've got any finds at this point and read Sandstorm. them out. Sandstorm. Sandstorm. So yeah, if, if, if you'd like to shout out anything that you've found and maybe brief explanation of what it might be. So, so you might need to repeat what people are saying. Yeah, yeah. I know, but I'm just playing it by ear now. Right, okay. <laughs> so it's Sandstorm. Sandstorm. Yes, John? Uh, which is a, basically Docker for web applications. Right. What runs? I think. Set, set everyone to sleep. Yeah. No. <laughs> hey, you've so, web app, sorry. so it's Docker. It's Docker for the people who want to host the web app, or for people who want to use the web app. So host the web app on your self-hosted service. Got you. Ah. So you can stand up an Etherpad or an EtherCalc instance with one click. Hang on, isn't right. that what Docker is? <laughs> it's without using the shell and it's being able to extract it and send it somewhere else. Really easily. Oh, that's good. Um, anybody else? You're all as bad as me. <laughs> um, have you guys got any finds? Yes. Oh, thanks, Andrew. Um, my my find I only found today, and it's thanks to uh, Mark Enom. Hello. <laughs> um, and it is that if you discover a gene, you get to name that gene. Is this correct? Yeah. Right? So there's a gene. So they're all... Um, Scientists use fruit flies when they're discovering genes, when they're analyzing the genome. Um, so there's a gene called Kenny, uh, named after the South Park character who dies because fruit flies that carry this gene die. Uh, there's a gene called agoraphobia, um, which is when the larva appears normal but just doesn't want to come out of its egg, <laughs> out of its shell. Um, there's a there's one called stuck on second, which is when the larva dies at the second stage of development. There's one called um, cheap date, where the <laughs> yeah, fruit, fruit flies get drunk quickly if they have the cheap date gene. And there, there's there's a big bunch more, but those are the only ones that I can remember. <laughs> so thank, thanks ever so much for expanding my neurons. One thing I was told recently is uh, if you discover a planet or asteroid or a similar thing, you get to name it. But uh, apparently there's rules. You're not allowed to name it after your mistress or your pet. 
<laughs> oh, what if you could put the encrypted data on the name of the uh, planet? Oh, yeah, and then you'd be you'd be off world security. So yeah. you know, yeah. nobody could prosecute you yeah. under interplanetary regulations. It's a good solution. That was my discovery. <sighs> thanks, thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Mark. Dis discovery over. Ben. My my find this fortnight is an endless source of finds. <laughs> what have you done? Yeah. <laughs> you said not to reveal it. <laughs> there is a podcast that's just about finds. They do it every week because they're amateurs. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's run by the uh, the people behind QI behind QI, the researchers of that. Uh, and yeah, it's just the stuff they've found in. Uh, in the course of researching QI. QI, the British television game show. Uh, institution, I think is the word. Right. <laughs> um, and uh, I'll give you a, a find that I yeah, had in this week's one was the person who has a record for most number of lightning strikes, he's been struck, I think it was eight times. When he was being struck the eighth time, that coincided with the 22nd time he had to fight off a bear with a stick. <laughs> <laughs> And he, they asked him about how, you know, how, how has this affected your life? And he said, the problem is, no one will stand near me when there's clouds. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but that podcast called No Such Thing as a Fish. And uh, if you find yourself having finished this podcast and uh, looking for something else, it's, uh, it's an intro. Not technical. Uh, it's some techie stuff, but not much. Neither is this podcast. Though. That's true. <laughs> Our legal <laughs> podcast. <laughs> yeah, this is good. <laughs> Have you had a chance to find anything? Yeah, I've got two finds, if that's okay. <sighs> no, it's brilliant. Yeah, okay, so my first uh, find is from, it was basically when you arrived in, about a couple of hours ago and asked me to do this, I, went, I turned around and went, I've forgotten everything I've ever known. I can't even think of a find. But uh, the people who are at the Hacker Public Radio table here at Camp with me, that's uh, Kim and Marshall who are sat in the middle there, they came to my rescue because they introduced me to something called Shuttle. That's spelled S-S-H, Uttle. You know. And it's to create your own quick and dirty uh, VPN. And it's really quite nifty. Um, please correct me if I've got this wrong because I've never used it. They just demonstrated it there and then to me. So you run uh, this little... Um, you, you install it from your package manager. You run it. So it's just, I think it's SHH shuttle. Um, and you need to have a server that you have. So I've got a wee server that sits in my house. I can SSH into that. And then it quite cleverly will install... doesn't need root access from the server. Uh, will install some clever Python stuff. You need Python 2.3 a better installed. So hardly anything needed in the server. And then you've got a virtual private network through your, you know, from wherever you are in the world, through your, you know, your home or your server, out to the rest of the internet. Um, um, sort of like a proxy, sort of poor man's VPN. So I can think of a number of things that that would, that would, that would help with. But, you know, if you want to set up a VPN but can't be bothered with the big fancy stuff, there you go. You can get it in just a few commands. So is it an actual VPN that you can connect to with other VPN stuff? No, no, it's not really. No, it's, it's not quite... VPN, and it's not quite SSH tunnel from what I understand. It's sort of an in the middle sort of hacky thing that does many of the things you'd want, but it's not a true VPN. It's not, you know, I wouldn't use it like in a sort of production enterprise environment, sort of thing. Okay. From what I've read of it, which is not much. It marks data on either side, so it's not sending TCP with TCP, so you can put DNS over it as well. Oh. Yeah. yeah. That's true, yeah. yeah. You just put dash dash DNS. Yep, and yeah, that, that actually... That makes it worth it. Yeah, that, that's something different, yeah. Well, it sounds like a handy thing. I've not actually used it myself, but I have a good authority that is useful and works. My second find actually is related to something you just mentioned, Ben. Um, now, some people crowdfund nice little gizmos to put on top of a Raspberry Pi. More ambitious people crowdfund fund magazines. But today I learned they're crowdfunding a rocket to the moon. Uh, and they're trying to, so in the, in the UK, £600,000, uh, so they have to get to that or it won't go ahead. Just buy all the sugar. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, they're, and, uh, and the idea is to send a small, it's a 22 tonne rocket, I think they said. And what it's going to take is, uh, it's called Moonspike. 
and uh, it's like a one gram thing that's going to be dropped onto the moon, made of titanium so it'll survive, but it's going to have lots of gigabytes of data on it. And if you contribute, I think it's more than 19 pounds, that's the limit, the reward is you get to put a bit of your data on it. So actually, yes. you can do exactly hey. what you just said. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, like contribute one your one megabyte for 19 quid you get one megabyte of white noise to put on there which yeah. people can decrypt to their heart's content the people doing this are they actual rocket scientists or are they some jokers who think they're rocket scientists no, I th well I I, 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 I again I was hurriedly looking through the website when I found this um, but it sounded like people with some real experience um, but they do want to take ideas from uh, like a wider group, so they don't just want to crowdsource the money, they want to get people involved in it. Um, now, hopefully not in the details of how rockets work, because I don't, you know, <laughs> I'm sure most people don't know about that, but they want uh, ideas of what's put on the wee stick and other bits and pieces of what photographs to take from space while they're up there. So, they're, like, getting people more involved, and, you know, the, the idea is it's a crowdfunded rocket. I mean, that's pretty cool, I thought. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And um, now the only slight snag is they're only, when I just looked a few minutes ago, uh, they're at seventy-eight thousand pounds out of the six hundred thousand, and it closes at ten p.m. tonight. <laughs> so, if everyone in this room <laughs> contributed uh, five hundred thousand divided by, let's say it was a hundred, yeah, there you go. Yeah, they would have five thousand pounds each, and you get a great reward for that. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Thanks. Um, that's we've got about ten, twelve. Minutes, so it must be time about for a halfway time. reminder. <laughs> <laughs> it's time for a halfway reminder. Still to come, voice of the masses. Um, no neurons, no neurons. Voice of the masses. <laughs> <laughs> um, un unusually, today we, we have a, a, a mass in front of us. Um, so you people, um, do people care about privacy? Uh, this seems to have been one of the, the recurring themes of, of Odd Camp this year. Um, yesterday, there was a podcaster's panel discussion starring Ben Everard. Um, <laughs> and it, what came out of that really is that um, a lot of people don't really care about privacy. But that some well, people the, do. It was speaking to the choir a little bit. Yes, the 1%, one, the, one the, the technocratic elite. Yeah. So I, I think most people in the audience, well, did, uh, how many people care about privacy? So that's nearly, it. that's probably yeah. everyone or nearly everybody. Is there anyone who doesn't care about privacy? It's a loaded question. It is, it yeah. is, and I suppose yeah. we've got to talk about it further. And that, that was a false, false uh, analysis in any case, because of course everybody's going to put their hand yeah. up. Um, in this room. Yeah, and that's... Sure if you went down into Liverpool Town Centre, See. Well, that was the point that I was trying to make. Who, yeah. Hands up, who cares about privacy? Probably wouldn't play So, just to rephrase the question a little bit. So, rather than do you care about privacy, do you think the population at large cares about privacy? No. 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 So, hands up now for people who think the population at large cares about privacy. So, I'd say 10%. To our listeners at home. Yeah. But yeah. What we need now is a is a roving microphone, but we don't have one. Would it would it help if I turn this round like that? It might help. <laughs> <laughs> it probably won't make it worse. I think the better question is how many people care if the NSA looked at my data? Yeah. That's the better question, right? So they don't care about privacy, they care about the government looking at their data. Or See, what would people be willing to give up in order to stop? Yeah, they say, get my data or whatever. Well, the point that I was going to make and the reason why I was asking initially was that I feel like then it's, it's our job to somehow convince everybody else that it's important. And that's, I don't know how that is best achieved because it, it, I think it's really important and it's going to be incredibly important in 20 years' time. And it's not simply about explaining what privacy is or what encryption is. Because those words are never used correctly. I mean, if you look at the talk, talk data breach this this week, the, the the statements that were made by talk, talk in particular. Firstly, it was a denial of service attack that then led to a data breach, which then revealed all kinds of vulnerabilities in the website. And when they talk about the passwords and the bank account details that were taken, they talk about the fact that the data was hidden. They can't even talk in terms of 
the technical side of what encryption is and what privacy must involve through that. And that's what worries me, is that the, it's, it's a too technical a discussion to be able to convince people effectively. But it is, it's inevitably a technical discussion. Because you say, oh, you're not using encryption right, and, or the, the language right. But even if you're using the language right, you don't. If someone says it's encrypted, they may be right. It might be massively badly encrypted. You know, you have to know, I mean, what point, you know, do you expect to know the particular algorithms or things like that? You know, they say, oh, the passwords are hashed. Are they salted? You know, which, which hashing algorithm have you used? It's a ridiculously complex subject. Talked about it in a different, in different terms, say security in terms of keeping prisoners in a prison. You don't have to know about the technical systems and how the body, you know, how the security systems work, but just to be able to say were they properly secured and that kind of thing. But for example, could could we I mean this is just completely off the top of my head. Could we come up with a system where the our own data is stored on our computers and then yeah, but, I mean, in some so everything else, all the authentication, everything else is done via some secure channel that we can trust. You mean SQRL? Well, yeah, I do mean. I mean, that's what. That's, I mean, I, I was there at the talk this morning. That's got me thinking that is, there could be a system where, in fact, you, privacy doesn't have to become a challenge of explaining privacy to somebody. You just explain a better solution to the problem, and okay. and, and this becomes like a big white format. So people don't have to have people willing to actually use this. You still have to have people caring about the problem in the first place. And they've got Just to, giving them a better solution isn't the answer. And they've got to care about it enough to then, ha like, there, there, there is technologies like this that exist. There, there are um, initiatives like Unhosted, yeah. where, which is a framework for writing web apps where people have their data locally. But you then have to ha tell everyone to set up their own data stores locally. Changing yeah. the subject for, for a second. You mentioned before about talk -talk and how they weren't saying about the data and how it was stored and how it wasn't stored. Um, some of the other, some of the security podcasts that I listen to, um, specifically the, the American ones are talking about how um, Target, who obviously had that massive, massive data loss last year, um, they lot, their share price went down for all of about a yeah. week and a half, yeah. and then it came straight back up again. Nobody cares about the fact their data was lost. People don't care generally about how their data is stored. People who do care about it are very much in the minority. And I can't see a way short of going out and... I mean, the number of people that my wife now sort of, sort of shrugs and walks them, walks them away from when I start talking about security stuff, you know, uh, don't worry about him, he's just waff waffling. <laughs> they don't care, people don't care. There are, and not there are people some, in this room. There are some <laughs> other people who care about this that aren't geeks or understand it. The ones who've been affected by it. Mm -hmm. like they've had their, their phone got the radio because they've had their bank account cleared out because yeah. it leaves leaked from talk talk. They don't care until it happens to them, basically. But the thing is, the thing is, the technical solutions exist. There are the technical so now, multiple technical solutions exist for these problems, but people aren't adopting them. I mean, people make fun of PGP. People say PGP is difficult to use. It's not. It's very difficult to understand. Yes. But it's a very, very easy system to use. But if nobody adopts it, it's useless. It's not a technical problem anymore. So, I, when I look at it, I think it's the question of how, how, how much can we control our privacy and how much are we going to compromise ourselves for convenience over privacy. And then the thing that I go further when I think about all this is trust. Now, if everyone really trusted each other, then this wouldn't matter in a sense. But most of what we do relies on trust. And when I think, say, for example, take banking, for instance, that's an area where trust has been fractured in recent years. And so something like Bitcoin comes along and says, you don't need to trust. The technical solution for Bitcoin means that, 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 that a big institution with all the computing power in the world can't overcome uh, this clever algorithm. I mean, maybe it's possible that that could happen, but at the moment, Bitcoin seems to be carrying on. So trust is no longer necessary because of the, the, that technical solution it offers. And I wonder in this case too, um, you know, are we ever going to, is there a technical solution that's good enough that we can always abandon trust. At some point, we're going to have to trust a company that we get services from. We're going to have to trust somebody that provides something to us that they won't do something with their data that we don't like. But unless we care about privacy, it, it, aren't they just 
aren't the big companies and the more data that goes into the cloud and more of our lives that goes into the cloud, isn't there going to just be more and more and more vul vulnerabilities which are going to lead to more and more and more data loss, more and more accounts and personal data being stolen in, in another 10 years' time? Unless, unless we like make a big enough noise or an issue about it now, it, it, it'll just... I just think it'll be. Out, I think it probably is out of control, because if if a, if um, a fifteen year old or a sixteen year old can cause this amount of disruption, what amount of disruption is being done by the profession by professionals who we never find out about, who have probably took the data two years ago? I, you know, I refuse to believe that a fifteen year old is the first person to have done it. I mean, it must have been that talk talk site. I said this. It must be something like simple CRM or something really ridiculous because it, it was a simple DDoS attack with an SQL injection. Yeah, like Charles play. So, so it would have, it would have, maybe it would have happened on a professional level a couple of years ago, and maybe that's happening to all of those sites Probably that are vulnerable. Is. And the and the answer then is back to being caring about privacy and caring about making the companies responsible for their to, for their. I mean, we've, we've had this discussion all day long, and I think you're missing the point. It's a certain age range of people that are within this room care about it. The children of the internet don't care. Yeah, but I'm saying it's our job to educate people. But we won't be around when when it does become the major problem. And by then, I, I think things will be just... That's just giving up. It's a cynical view, I know, but there you go. How are you supposed Laura. to know how serious a privacy thing is? Because privacy is a scale. There isn't private versus not private. It's this massive scale. And how... How, if everybody's using a service, yes, some people might say that that's not a very secure service. But if everybody else is using it, it feels less of a problem. It's what the norm is. And so you've got, it's really hard to judge what's serious or not. So you can't really say people don't care. The, you know, every indicator to them is that it's fine. Yeah, I think if you ask somebody, do you care about uh, privacy? Uh, then they might go, oh no, and then say, would you like it if all your banking details were spread across the internet along with your password? To go, no, I don't like that. You know, so I guess the question is getting people to think about it more deeply and also decide where is it I want privacy, where is it I want control of my data, and where like I actually want to share all this data. You know, it's, it's, it's giving, about giving people control, but to have those controls, you have to trust somebody else. And that's, that's the problem that I come and stuck on is, we have to rely on trust. If we don't rely on trust, we don't really have any society. So the question is, how far is it technical? How far is it trust? But also, what, how, knowing what the consequences are of certain things. So people might, you know, some people might not like being tagged on Facebook because that's giving data about who they are, what they look like, and things. But then also, you know, there's benefits to being tagged on Facebook because it's part of your social interactions. And things. It, it, it's just so. There's a lot of trade off and it suddenly becomes less important if you're getting more out of it. Yes, I'm Mac. I'm, 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 I'm an addict, I suppose, but my daughter is very bad. I'm not technical at all. She won't be logging with Facebook when you're signing to other sites using your Facebook ID. Basically, because she's got, it's quite a rudimentary understanding of how it works, but she doesn't trust it. She doesn't trust Facebook itself. She likes Facebook to use it, happy for them to have a But she won't use other sites because she's vaguely, sort of hazily conscious that these other sites will be picking up stuff about her that she doesn't want to know. So people, I think people do care about it. People do understand this on, a, on quite a rudimentary level. But being able to point at things like that and say, this sort of thing is a problem, people get that and go, oh, right, okay, that is a problem. Yeah, so that building on that company, well, we say, well, people don't care, let's just start by our hands and be a kind of Yeah, yeah. But there's, a, there's another thing as well. Um, it's all well and good saying, I care about privacy, I don't want to share what I'm doing. I'm going to use an anonymization network, like Tor, safe argument. Like the guy that was running Silk Road, <laughs> who got arrested because he was logging into his admin console, not using Tor. So it's all well and good saying, I care about privacy, I'm going to take steps to protect my privacy. If you don't take it all the way, you effectively, you, you can put yourself in a position where, well, 
I'm, I'm going to be private except for, well, I'm going to use Facebook because all my friends use Facebook. Well, okay. So I'm going to be private except for Facebook and, oh, I'm on Twitter. And you keep, this, this paper cuts. I think you can also flip that round and say, okay, the majority of the people, admittedly, at the moment, give away huge quantities of data through a thousand little things. And you're never going to convince someone to just suddenly turn all that off. You know, delete all your online accounts, go completely dark. But you can just gradually bring it back little by little. Like you said, it's a scale. You're, we're probably never going to get to perfect, but we can get to an awful lot better we are at the, than we are at the moment. And it's things like, um, we run our own website, I'm sure a lot of you guys do. We see the referrals, and I've mentioned this quite a few times. Our DuckDuckGo referrals are going through the roof. I mean, admittedly, it's from very little to slightly less little, but it's still in, it's doubling every few months. And that is, that is a perfect sign of people caring about privacy. It's not everyone, but it's more than it was a year ago, which was more than it was two years ago, which was more than it was three years ago. And it's these little steps people are taking. It's installing an ad blocker. It's um, not putting everything on Facebook, just putting some things on. It's, it's the little bits that you move bit by bit, I think. I think there's another aspect of the law that can really help here and well that could potentially help and it's if I was a talk talk customer I would want to sue talk talk for giving my data away. Why that that, that yeah. wasn't yours to let hackers get their hands on that was my data why can't I Also you'll be the last person to know. Yeah. You know they 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 also should have an obligation to tell you as soon as they well they do but they don't follow up on it. Yeah. Where's the <laughs> consumer rights protections for data? I just I just want to say that the chap at the back there made the point about uh, the government law and legislation. I think it's a very good point. In climate change, governments were about to legislate on that, and companies, big companies, big corporate companies, were thinking, "All oh, right, this is a law. We'll have to do something now and start putting money into it." But then, after Kyoto failed, after Obama didn't do that much about climate change, they all stopped and they stopped spending money on it. So, I think actually, governments are more powerful here than we probably, you know, mm. in the in the good sense and the bad sense. And this is the good sense: is that they could enforce things within countries uh, that would cause big companies to at least do the basics, like encrypt passwords, uh, which Talk Talk failed to do. Yeah. And that's all the time we've got, I think. Um, thanks very much for your contributions and uh, thanks for coming on and listening to the podcast. Thank you.